800 as amended is the state budget and the state capital plan. Um, and what a difference it is a year later to be back in our own house, in our own chamber, all together after being at the Bank of Springfield Center during the height of the COVID pandemic. And we've accomplished a lot together in that year, working together with the House, the Senate, and Governor Pritzker to begin to re restore the fiscal stability of our state. We've made great strides this year. We've had a lot of accomplishments. The budget we passed last year helped our state through the most difficult and dark hours of a pandemic. It served the people of Illinois. It brought the resources to our communities. It provided the health care folks needed. And now we're ready to move on and con to continue to reopen, restart, and revitalize the state and continue to uh, stabilize our fiscal condition. You know, not too many years ago, we had a $17 billion bill backlog in this state. As of this morning, our bill backlog was about $3.2 billion. So $3.2 billion, that is the lowest it has been in many a year. We are paying down $3 billion, nearly $3 billion of debt with this budget that we'll be voting on today. It includes $2.1 million in a payment in full of the municipal liquidity facility, which we borrowed to see our way through the pandemic. By doing so, we'll be saving the taxpayers of Illinois $100 million in interest costs. And as well, in fiscal years 23 and 24, because of this and another action we will take in this, in, in this budget, we'll actually have another $1, million, $1 billion in GRF that can go to costs such as evidence-based model, child care, senior care, in both fiscal years 23 and 24. By, so by the fiscally responsible actions we're taking today, not only do we pay down nearly $3 billion in debt, we set ourselves up for successful years in FY23 and FY24 also. This proposal here contains no tax increases. We have uh, about a billion dollars that will come into the state from ARPA for different capital projects. We'll fully fund the evidence-based model. We make substantial additional contributions to the Guidehouse study for the development, developmentally disabled. And I, I just want to thank you know, my colleague, Representative Michelle Musman, who has been such a strong advocate for those children and those folks who need us so much. In addition, we're dispersing some of the ARPA money in this budget. And I say some because, you know, we're, we're trying to work as prudently as we can to be sure, one, that we get, uh, we get substantial amounts of money into our economy this summer and also into the hands of our community-based organizations, our not-for-profits, uh, to serve the people during the summer, especially our young folks during the summer months when they're going to need some support. But also, we're not spending all the money at once. We're deciding to spend some money to get you know, cash into the economy and cash into the hands of you know, serving organizations. But also, we're realizing that this is a four, that this is federal money was designated as a four-year pot of money. So we're stewarding it out over time so that we don't run off a, a cliff. And we're also taking the time to spend money and make decisions in the future so that we can recalibrate, we can be strategic, we can be planful, and we can prioritize how this money is spent. In the initial allocations, we are putting a uh, tremendous amount of money where our priorities are. had a sheet that told you these things. So there is uh, $46 million for improving educational outcomes, $45 million to, for community support, $106 million to support our families, 
of $578 million for businesses, small businesses, hospitality, tourism, $475 million for public health response, $183 million to violence prevention and addressing uh, 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 social determinants of health, I forgot that word for a moment, and $104 million for homelessness and affordable housing. So this is a quick summary of what's in the budget. You have analyses in front of you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Leader Harris. This bill is on short debate. Leader Dimmer is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the sponsor yield? In any case that he will. Uh, Leader Harris, thank you for that uh, description. I, I would note this amendment, Floor Amendment 1, was introduced at 12.15 this morning, then Floor Amendment 2 came sometime late this evening, and Floor Amendment 3 was introduced uh, just, I don't know, five or six minutes ago. These are not uh, page-in-line amendments where we can simply see what the changes are. These are gut-and-replace amendments. So we really have no ability to analyze what's changed between one draft and the next. But I won't belabor that process point because we've been belaboring it for years and nothing changes. So let me just ask you, in the floor amendment that's been adopted here, what is the total revenue projection for fiscal year 22? That would be 42 billion 315 million in GRF. This morning, or earlier this afternoon in committee, you indicated that the GRF revenue was approximately $41.3 billion. Has something changed, or was that just a misstatement earlier? Well, as I said this morning, the chart I had in front of me was dated okay. a different day. So sure. this is the accurate information. Thank you. And the overall spending number? $42 billion, $220 million. Uh, Earlier this year, when the governor proposed uh, his budget, he proposed nearly a billion dollars worth of um, tax increases of one kind or another. He called them loopholes. Certainly, a uh, scholarship program for low-income children isn't a loophole, corporate loophole. Which of those uh, tax increases did you decide to incorporate into this budget? Uh, those are not in this bill. The revenues from those are in this bill. So what, it, what, the, uh, what we're discussing are the net operating loss uh, uh, deduction, the accelerated depreciation, uh, freezing the uh, fr franchise tax at its current level, and the uh, foreign dividend advantage. And together, is it fair to say that that's a, about 650 or $660 million? In that vicinity. Yeah. These are $660 million that would not have been owed in taxes by Illinois businesses that will now be owed in taxes by Illinois businesses as a result of these changes? Well, in many of these cases, uh, if the federal government had not changed their policies, we would have been collecting those taxes as a part of standard procedure. That's right. The federal government did change their policies, though, and they did so a couple of years ago. And Illinois businesses saw federal tax changes and saw what the state tax treatment was. And these, uh, these changes tonight are going to result in an additional $660 million in taxes for Illinois businesses. Uh, another point, the, the elimination of the franchise tax was an initiative that had broad bipartisan support and was indeed signed into law by the governor uh, just about two years ago. Um, your proposal tonight, I believe, freezes the phase out of the franchise tax. Now, the franch eliminating the franchise tax was an item that um, Republicans uh, brought to the table during bipartisan capital bill negotiations, and we secured an agreement to eliminate that. Our initial proposal, in fact, was to eliminate the franchise tax immediately. There was a request made uh, by your side of the aisle that we phase it out over the course of a few years. And in order to be reasonable, we accepted that agreement. I was worried at the time that we might get to a point like this, where that agreement and our uh, accommodation of a phase-out schedule would be frozen. Freezing the franchise tax where it is today will mean that 
6,206 businesses who had seen in state statute that the franchise tax was going to be eliminated will now see that it's not going to be eliminated and that those over 6,200 businesses will, in, will be required to continue to pay a franchise tax in the future because our bipartisan agreement is being broken here tonight. So after we look at what uh, these hundreds of millions of dollars in new taxes that businesses will owe, we also have to think about the over $5 billion of debt that exists in the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund, which, if it's not addressed, will result in significant benefit reductions for unemployment recipients and significant tax increases for employers. Does uh, this budget allocate money to reduce the debt in the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund? We are uh, putting $100 million in to pay interest uh, to the trust fund. We have a difference of um, opinion on, I, I should, wouldn't say opinion, there are two different um, uh, narratives being talked about about the use of that $100 million. I know we've had a discussion about that earlier. I just, I, I thought I'd clarify, it's my understanding most recently that that $100 million deposit in the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund is not to pay interest, but instead to um, cover the cost of the expansion of unemployment insurance to non-instructional uh, education employees and to allow for the waiver of non-fraud related IDES overpayments in the last year. Okay. Okay. I'm corrected by my colleague that you are correct and I was wrong in my explanation. So the, the unemployment insurance trust fund debt is not being addressed. You are correct. I was incorrect. Okay. What is the, um, <clears throat> you, this year's budget, and you know, one of the reasons we have paid even further attention to the ability to analyze this year's budget is that every state budget is complex, and you know, we, both, we both know that. This year, though, is particularly complex because of the uh, unique one-time treatment of the receipt of both some remaining funds from the CARES Act as well as new funds from ARPA. Uh, what, uh, you know, and I know ARPA has multiple uh, features, but much attention has been given to the approximately $8.1 billion that the state government will receive, over which we have a greater degree of control still within the federal rules. So of that $8.1 billion, what does uh, this bill appropriate from those funds? Approximately $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion in uh, ARPA-related funds appropriated here. Is there an additional uh, appropriation for capital funds? If, if capital projects are funded and go out, there would be hopefully another billion dollars there. Is that included in this bill or is that in the capital appropriation bill? The capital is in this bill, so it would be $1.5 in, in general okay. operating and a billion in capital. And we, we then would uh, remain with approximately $5.5 billion of uh, ARPA state funds that have not yet been appropriated and could not be spent without further legislative action? Yes. Uh, we address this in committee, and I'd like to um, enlighten all members of the House about this. When we talked about the capital appropriations. Leader Demer, please bring your remarks to a close. Then a debate was announced. Short debate was announced. To the bill. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, we have contained in this bill as was discussed in committee this afternoon, a billion dollars in capital projects at the request of member initiatives from one side of the aisle. These are federal funds funded by people who pay federal taxes. Each of us in every district in Illinois have constituents who pay federal taxes, whose tax dollars have been collected and sent back to the states for equitable use. My question would have been, when you were making those capital requests and after you had visited the redistricting map room, did those capital requests come for your new districts or for your old districts? Another of the problems of a politician picking their own districts. 
You can now make that pleasant phone call to say, good news, Mayor, I've drawn you into my district, and I have a little cash to give you as well. I would also like to point out that in the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, there are 46 new grants ranging between $50,000 and $2.6 million. 46 new grants. For those member initiatives as well, in the Department of Human Services, 76 new grants ranging between $50,000 and Thank you, Leader million. Demmer. Please bring your remarks to a close. Mr. Speaker, we've talked many times in this chamber about it being a new day. The only new day is going to happen in five minutes when the clock strikes midnight. Because what we're seeing on this floor is the same dark, old days that we've struggled under for years. This is not appropriate. This is not the way things should be handled. We all know that. Let's give transparency a chance. The only change that happens here is change that we make happen. Vote no. The question is, shall Senate Bill 2800 pass? All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. The vote is open. Have all voted who wish? Have all voted who wish? Have all voted who wish? With the clerk, please take the record. On this question, there are 72 voting in favor, 44 voting against, and one voting present. And this bill, having received a constitutional majority, is hereby declared passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, this is the uh, BIMP bill for FY22. It contains numerous provisions that effectuate the budget in the bill we debated previously. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm announcing it will be a short debate. Leader Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to ask questions. I'm going to go right to the Senate bill. We're close to midnight. Some of this stuff could have been done earlier. I know we have more things on the plate. Pembroke Township, energy. But we're not going to be able to get to them because we are going to go past midnight. Makes things a little more difficult, and that I'm disappointed. But let me start by saying every session I come in, I, I come in with a, a clear mind and a hopeful spirit. I hit the reset button every year. Hope that we can start over again, do things in a better way. I have hope that we can work together to solve the countless problems that this chamber has created. What this chamber has created. Because what the problems that this chamber has created affects every person, every man, woman, and child in this state. Whether it's our soaring pension costs, our out-of-control property taxes, our ever-expanding state budget, and yes, our, deter our deteriorating business climate. These problems that haven't been created in this chamber have consequences. I think it's pretty obvious that people are not calling Illinois it's their home anymore. They are truly leaving our state. That's clear. And once again, this budget and frankly, this session have stolen my optimism and the hope that so many Illinoisans had for a new day in Springfield. What we have here is the same old story, the same old song and dance, a last-minute budget. Boy, is it last minute. That spends billions of additional dollars irresponsibly. Here are some of the highlights or lowlights of what you decided to prioritize despite your claims of a, of a deficit. Get this, congratulations. Members of the House and Senate get a pay raise. I'm sure we all earned it. Legislative district office allowances were doubled at the same time every employer in our state is trying to cut costs to stay afloat. Talk about priorities. And get this, in this BIM budget, whatever you want to call it, over a billion dollars in new unvetted pork spending by the House Democrats 
for Democrats. Every resident in Illinois has suffered over this past year. People lost their jobs, families lost their homes, employers lost their businesses. Illinoisans lost their dignity. And so many of us have also lost a loved one to COVID. However, the only people who didn't lose anything are the Illinois Democrats, who are keeping the good times rolling with more pork and even a pay raise. The question I have is why we didn't fund the trust fund, the unemployment trust fund. That may be the most important social safety net program that we have in the state, the unemployment trust fund. Remember, we are $5 billion, $5 billion in the hole. The one program that kept so many afloat during the governor's shutdown, during the hard times that so many faced, we're not putting a penny towards it, nothing. Now, with your vote on this spending plan, you'll turn your back on this program and refuse to fill the hole that was meant so much to employers and workers across the state. You said that your salary and your special interests were more important than the working men and women and their employers in Illinois. We receive billions of federal money to spend. Nothing goes to the trust fund. So here's what's going to happen. It's pretty obvious. We've heard this before. The benefits people relied on will be cut or reduced, and employers, just as they are able to open their doors and start hiring again, which we see going on right now, will have to pay more to cover for your pay raises. As I said earlier, I had hoped this year, hope for a new day in Springfield. I just couldn't have been more wrong based on what's happening tonight. The question is, shall Senate Bill 2017 pass? All those in favor vote aye. All those opposed vote nay. The voting is open. For all voters who wish, for all voters who wish, have all voted who wish. The clerk, please take the record. On this question, there are 73 voting in favor, 44 voting against, Zero voting present. And this bill, having received a constitutional majority, is hereby declared passed. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.